um, and that is greetings to you all. My name is Kanyon Dogo Zongobo. I am a psychiatrist. I'm also a senior Atlantic fellow with the Global Brain Health Institute. I am from Durban, KwaZulu Natal, in South Africa. I currently am working as a psychiatrist and I'm also um, a part of the University of Kuzulu Natal teaching department, and I also do research with older adults. I've been a part of numerous projects, but currently doing a project um, looking at um, the knowledge, attitudes, and practices in dementia care of general pr practitioners and also traditional healers, um, and looking towards care pathways um, and developing care pathways and guidelines that are locally appropriate for the setting um, and for our population. So what I understand about patient and public involvement, so in our teaching or in our setting, it's not a term that is common um, and it's not a, a term or a practice that is commonly used. But my understanding is that it is using the people or the public or the patients to inform the research that you're doing um, and not just inform but have them as part of the research team as a part of the working team to inform the research that you're doing and looking at benefiting the people that you're doing the research with so it's doing research with people and not doing research particularly on people or for people but having everyone being included um, in part of the research team and with regards to the outputs and outcomes of the research project. So with the current project that we're doing, how patient and public involvement has informed the project is that from inception or from when we were thinking around a research question, we included people with lived experience and included patient and public involvement. So from the research question, to the study design methodology, to also the research questionnaires and tools um, towards every, every single part of the project um, to date and still carrying on will be informed um, and has been informed by patient and public involvement and patient and public voice. This project is the first time that I've incorporated patient and public involvement or patient and public voice in the study formally um, and looking at all facets of the study. So this is the first study that has uh, patient and public involvement partners or collaborators as part of the research team. So I believe that patient and public involvement um, has changed how I conduct research and the research that we're doing because it allows you um, to actually get to understand the real problems. So as a researcher, you can have an idea of this is what I feel will be impactful or this is where I feel the needs are. But when you sit and meet with people that are involved um, in the that should be involved in the project and the public, they give you another perspective of, of their needs, but you also get in insights into the lived experience, which then informs your research, not just the question, but how to go about the research and what will be feasible and what the needs of the public and the patients um, are on the ground. So your research is more informed, but your research will also then be more impactful because we are doing research with people and research that will be helpful to the people that we're doing the research for or with. When looking at whether other professionals will incorporate PPI into their work, I think it's still in our setting, so in the South African setting, it's still enough. So it's not something that is discussed every day. It's not something that informs or research meetings and research groups. But I think when there's more exposure to it and what it can, the benefits that it can bring, but also maybe seeing projects. So, you know, with people like me that have started doing it, um, us documenting, us explaining what's happening, and people looking at our projects.
that will give people, I think, an understanding, but also the confidence to do it. Because, I mean, as a clinician, as an academic, we don't always work with people on the ground. So it may maybe at times be daunting to them. But when they see a project as to from the start to the end, how it was used, that should give people more confidence to actually incorporate it into their projects as well. So we, when we invite people with lived experience onto the research project, um, personally, things I've experienced is that you need to be sure about what you're, what you're aiming to research or what your, the theme of your research is. Um, because there are a lot of needs and there's a lot of questions that people may have in the team, as with all research teams. Um, there's multiple collaborators and they have different needs. So it's important to understand that people with lived experience of patient and public voice involvement is not, they are not researchers. So they are people. So you as the academic, as the researcher, need to guide certain discussions so that you don't sometimes lose track of where you are going. Um, and at other times, it's being able to reach the people that you need to reach, um, their availability, but also appreciating their time. So in my project, I've worked with general practitioners, I've worked with people with lived experience, also working with traditional healers. So it's having an understanding and a respect for all the people um, and understanding that you're not just taking from them. They are part of the team. So you respect them. They're also collaborators in your team. So it's having that respect, but then also understanding that as the team lead, you need to direct and need to manage your project going forward. So how you distinguish um, or how people understand their role, whether they are research participants or part of the PPI team is that you need to educate them and inform them about what this is because as much as it may be foreign to us as academics, the, the whole experience may be foreign to the people that you're inviting to join. So it's under, explaining to them, you know, this is a research project, this would be your role, um, this is how far you need to go um, in the project and then allowing them to then understand it and then also agree to be a part of the project, being informed. So informed consent, informed collaboration, so that they know what their roles are and that will also guide how and if they want to be involved in the project. So it's about education and information sharing between you as the researcher um, and the people that you have invited to be a part of your research project. So um, as part of uh, this current project, um, we met with traditional healers um, as part of an, part of the public and uh, public involvement in informing the research. Um, and it was very interesting because as a clinician, um, you, we don't really routinely get to interact with people um, or with traditional healers in our day-to-day -day experience. So one of the things um, that was just yeah that stood out was the the need to respect culture and respect people that you're working with. So as a researcher, for instance, you go into a space and you say, okay, I have two hours and in two hours I need to be done, but you need to then understand that they have procedures, they have protocols, um, and they have ways that they need to do things. So it's, it's that respect. But also there's this, you know, this notion sometimes in academic spaces that traditional healers don't want to collaborate. Um, and it's then understanding. So you, I went into the space and they explained, no, the reason why we don't really want to collaborate with academics is academics come, they do research on us, they leave, and then they never come back and tell us what was happening. We never get the results. And then another group will come, we must stop everything we're doing. They do research and they leave. So, um, you know, they were kind of like, initially, like we, we actually don't sometimes like working with researchers because you guys are not fair. So it's understanding that where something will be known as a barrier, but when you understand why it's a barrier, then you can go around that barrier and explain. But also they were really interested in dementia. They wanted to know about dementia and other people were like, oh no, we've seen people with that or someone in my family had that. And then there was a lot of buy-in even at that time to say, okay, maybe do some, can you do some training with us? Can you do some teaching with us? So there's, there's, 
often this, I think, this misunderstanding that sectors don't want to collaborate. But it's literally when you go and respect people and explain to people, people want to collaborate, but maybe sometimes us as researchers, we go there with these, you know, intentions and protocols and this is how things must be done. And when you're in a space, you must appreciate that space and respect that space and then you, you, you can mitigate problems that may arise that way. something just to share is to encourage people to involve, um, to encourage researchers to involve patient and public um, voice um, and people with lived experience in their research because it really does enrich what you are trying to do. Because we, we ha always have this like research question and this is what we need to do but when you actually meet with people you realize that you there's so much more you can do. There's actually maybe another way you can get around your answer or getting around your question, but it really informs your research and really increases the value, the impact, the outcomes, the output. And it also opens more doors for further research because you are now creating a team, you're creating a hub. Um, and it then just speaks to us as researchers being able to move our work forward um, outside of just our own spaces. So yeah, that would be my advice.